everyone, and can you guess what we're going to be talking about today? Uh, let me begin by thanking everybody once again for coming this morning and uh, getting out of bed and joining us. And if this is your first time here, we'd certainly like to welcome you a very special hello because we're starting this brand new series called Why We Do What We Do. And if you happen to fall asleep or you happen to miss something, you can always go back to our YouTube channel, theodysseychurch.com forward slash uh, I'm sorry, theodysseychurch.com forward slash YouTube, or you can go to our website and watch it there, theodysseychurch.com. Or if somebody comes to mind, you know, that you think it needs to hear one of our messages, because we don't usually think the message is for us, do we? We always know somebody that it's for. We hear something and we say, boy, I wish so-and-so was here. What they need to hear, thanks to our church secretary, uh, Jennifer Wheelman, they can go to our website, they can go to our YouTube channel, and they can... Watch it there. We can see it anywhere in the world, thanks to the power of the internet. And the reason we decided to do this series is actually twofold. You know, first, maybe you're like a lot of people, and you think to yourself, why start a new church? Isn't there enough few churches in this area? Isn't there enough churches already in this area? And the answer to that is yes and no. It's not a simple answer, because there are a lot of churches. There's already a lot of churches in this area. In fact, if you would go to the yellow pages or the white pages, you would see that there's about 200 churches just in our small area here on the uh, local part of Sussex County and into Worcester County. The problem is, as we did our research, we found that there were a lot of people that these churches were reaching. You know, the fact is, what, according to the census, the 2010 census of Sussex County, two out of every three church people aren't, or two out of three people coming in Sussex County aren't church. It would have been a whole lot easier to join an existing church. It would have been easier on our lead team, and it would have been easier on me. In fact, I might even got a paycheck, and that would have helped my family out a whole lot. But our research found, even though there are a lot of churches in this area, most people in this area don't attend any type of religious uh, uh, church at all, any type of religious organization at all. You know, I thought this being a rural area, that, that we'd be doing a pretty good job with our outreach. The number of people being committed to finally and follow Jesus, the abundant life that he offers, would be doing pretty good. But I was wrong. Because nationally, one out of every, out of every two people have some sort of religious affiliation, whether it's Christian or Catholic or Muslim or Protestant or Jewish. There's some kind of religious belief. But in Sussex County, even though we have all these churches, the churches aren't reaching the majority of the people. So like the video you just watched says, we're trying to reach out in our community and trying to do some things that other churches aren't doing. You know, if I'm going to reach people, if this church is going to reach people, if our lead team is going to reach people that no one else is reaching, we've got to do some things that no one else is doing. You know, it just makes common sense. So that's why when you walk in the door, there's an outside bistro. There's, a, there's an area for people to sit and talk and fellowship and have donuts and coffee. That's why we, we make this church a casual atmosphere because we want people that don't normally feel comfortable in churches to feel comfortable here. And we can bring our coffee and our donuts in while we're listening to the sermon. We allow it in the sanctuary. A lot of churches don't do that. The Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us that their condemnation and those that are in Christ Jesus. So we don't try to be condemned. That's why we have a, a Thursday night football where we offer free pizza or hamburgers and hot dogs just to come out and have a night with your families or, or with friends and people like yourself. And some of those people that started coming to our church were people that never went to church before, but that we, you know, we just come in and we love on them on Thursday nights. And God has just been blessing that ministry. So instead of trying to get people to come here and don't misunderstand me. It's not that we're not looking to get church people here. We need them. We love them. They're important to our ministry because we couldn't operate without them. But we want to be kingdom builders, not kingdom transfers. So we're actually trying to build a church that's reaching unchurched people. And we do this because we feel that's what Jesus does. You know, we feel that there's a lot of people out there that have been hurt by the church, hurt by religious organizations because of some kind of man-made rules and even when they're good intentions, I mean, even in their good intentions, people uh, sometimes hurt other people with their rules and regulations. I, I remember one time we had tried for, for a long period of time to get this young teenage girl to come to our vacation Bible school at a church I was in one time. And, and when she comes to church, she comes to church, and she's not dressed like the rest of the kids. I mean, she, she doesn't come to church very long. She's got a belt on, the belt's got peace symbols. 
She, you know, after months of trying to get this girl to church, she comes to the church, she gets to the front step, the guy at the front door sees her, looks at her peace belt, and says, you know, that's just nothing but broken crosses. That's what the peace sign book is. You know, you wear that and you're going to be condemned to hell. You need to take that off. That girl left that church that night. She never went back in. And to my knowledge, she's never been in another church again. His intentions were good. But he didn't love on her. And she left the church and she didn't come back. So we want to reach out and love like Jesus did. Those who feel that maybe because of their sin or maybe because of their past sin or maybe even their present sin, they wouldn't be welcome in a lot of churches. We want to reach out and love those like Jesus did who weren't even sure if they believe in Jesus yet. Or maybe they, they had some kind of addiction or maybe they still have some kind of addiction or some kind of lifestyle that some churches wouldn't make them feel very comfortable. We want to welcome them. We want them to feel loved so that one day, maybe, just maybe, they'll see through our love for them. They'll see Jesus' love for them and something will click in and they will make Jesus Lord over their life. We're currently in the process of creating an elementary program in this immediate area and we're trying to make the best elementary program that we can make so that we can reach children, not just with a religious belief, but with the tools to live their life in such a way that they'll be successful in their relationship, they'll be successful in their finances, they'll be successful in their careers. Because we know whether you believe in Jesus or not, if you follow his principles as described in the scriptures, whether you believe in him or not, but if you follow his principles, you will live life and you'll live it more abundantly. And nobody can deny it. Nobody can deny it. The, the, the strongest atheist in the world can't deny that if you find the principles that are set forth in Scripture, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that your life will be better. So, we're getting ready to start a team ministry, a young adult ministry. And we're hoping over time to create and develop these environments which are so exciting and so comfortable, even if you're not convinced Jesus is who he says he is, that you would still come to the Odyssey Church because you enjoy the experience. And one day, one day, maybe, maybe, you'll see Jesus as who he is, as who he said he was, not just the Son of God, but God himself. And we don't have a hidden agenda. We've spoke that since the very beginning. But we also want to make it easy, as you'll hear next week, to make it easy for those of you who do believe, so that you'll want to invite your family and your friends, that you'll want to invite the people that you love. And that's the reason that we started this new church. We believe that God's called a small group of people, just as he did in the first century, to go out. And we chose the Selbyville area because it's right for the harvest, based on our research. This area is right for harvest. There is a lot of people who need the hope and the love and the comfort that we believe can only be found in Jesus Christ. But for me personally, it, it goes much deeper than that. You know, I read this article the other day about a, a lady, and her name was uh, Shirley Diver, and a man by the name of David Hartsock. And you can find the entire article in the July 29th edition of Sports Illustrated, July 29th, 2014. On August 1st of 2009, 54-year-old 54 year old Shirley Diver decided to go skydiving for the first time. She was attached to this experienced trainer. You know, it's a tandem jump. David Horsock was his name, and they were descending from 13,500 feet. Now, David had done this hundreds and hundreds of times before. He pulls the ripcord at 5,000 feet, just as he always had done, and instantly he said he knew something was wrong. A parachute release can be jarring, and all of a sudden you're, you're going real fast, and you stop and you slow down when the, when the chute expands. But this was different. David felt that he something that he described as a violent jerk. And then he heard a, a loud pop from above. He said the canopy malfunction had been so violent that it had yanked the cutaway handle and it was stuck between him and Shirley. And he couldn't reach it. And worse, there's a, there's a safety, there's a second cutaway handle, but it's blocked by her body as, they, as they're jumping tandem. Shirley in front of him, him behind. As they dropped past 4,000 feet, David knew that he was running out of time. He had roughly 20 seconds until the point of no return, roughly 20 seconds before they reached 1,500 feet, and after 1,500 feet, there's really not a whole lot you can do. As they passed 2,500 feet, Shirley came to the realization this was probably going to be her last day on earth, and the only thing she could think of was, Lord, please, I don't want my children to see me die this way. 
they were on the ground watching. As they reduced their speed, they were going 100 miles an hour, as they reduced their speed from 100 to 60, but they were past the point of no return. They were at 1,500 feet, and they were still plummeting towards the earth. Worse, now they began spinning. The time to try and fix the canopy was over. It was time to start looking at the ground. What happened next was really nothing short of miraculous. David Hartsock, this experienced trainer, yelled out, Shirley, I want you to pull your legs up now and get ready for a really rough landing. And he said with that, she kicked, kicked, Shirley kicked her feet out, and as she did, she began to feel herself twist upward. Behind her, David pulled down on the canopy line so hard that he dislocated both his shoulders, and at the same time, he kicked his own legs, so he inverted their position. Now she's on top, he's on the bottom. So here's this 44-year-old man who spent most of his own life, by his own admission, largely in pursuit of his own selfish ambitions. And he's become a human canopy, a human cushion for this woman he'd only met about a half hour ago. They say the impact was so loud it could be here for over a quarter mile away. So I said moments later, her, her eyes began to open and she began to blink, and then she saw light, and then she saw the clouds, Beneath her, she felt this motionless body of David Hartsock. Joey says today she has no health issues stemming from that parachute failure. No issues from the accident. She described herself as good as new. And David, well, he survived, but he didn't get quite so lucky. He's a quadriplegic, now confined to a wheelchair. And when you ask David about his decision to place himself between Shirley and the hard Texas ground, he says, I, I did what I felt was necessary for taking care of my student. To me, that was the most important thing, making sure Shirley got down safely. As he discusses his bravery and heroism, he gives his credit to a combination of values that were instilled in him by his parents and what the parachuting community had done for him. Because in the parachuting community, everybody looks out for everybody else. It's a very nurturing atmosphere. He said, that's what I loved about it so much. And I thought to myself as I read that, as the lead pastor, as someone who truly believes in heaven and hell, thought about what David said, and then I had to ask myself, and I would challenge you to ask yourself, especially if you're a Christian, ask yourself, who's more loving? <coughs> Excuse me. Who's more loving, a skydiver instructor or me as a disciple of Christ? Would I be willing to die so someone I barely knew could live? <coughs> Excuse me. Do I do everything I can to rescue people from an eternal death and hell so they can live and live safely for all eternity, wrapped in the arms of Jesus in heaven? Am I willing to take some risk? Do I serve others who can do nothing for me in return? Am I so brave and so courageous for this community as David Hassark was for the person he barely knew? Will I step out and serve others, even if it means that I have to deny myself? Will I, will you step out of our comfort zone, step out of the crowd, even if it means denying ourselves to help people find and follow Jesus? Does the environment of parachute look out for each other more than the disciples of the church or the disciples of Jesus Christ. The reason I do what I do, the reason the Odyssey Church does what it does, we do it because we love. We love people enough to step out of the crowd and serve and love on and instruct people in the commands of Jesus so in turn that they can go out and help other people and love on them and instruct them and teach them the command. We do this so that we can help people prepare to live in this world and prepare to die and live in the next world. Now the second reason that I think, I said there was a twofold reason, the second reason I think that this series is so important, so as the members and the people who come to the Odyssey Church will not only know why we do what we do, but so they can catch the vision of what we believe in, what we believe God has called us to do, and how we're going to accomplish this vision. So, the, so this week we're going to answer the question why we do what we do, and then next week we're going to attempt to answer the what behind the why we do what we do, and then in the third week we're going to look at the how 
behind the why we do what we do. So I'm so glad that you joined us this morning, and hopefully after today, some of the questions you may have as to why we started the Odyssey Church will be answered. Now, more importantly, if you're a regular attendant, I want you to try to get involved in our church. The easy answer as to why we ask you to do that, the easy answer why we do what we do is because Jesus commands us to do it. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. A section of scripture found in the Gospel of Matthew, the story that Matthew wrote that he knew as he saw it about Jesus. But this story is, is actually recorded in all four of the Gospel, all four of the histories of Jesus' life, and also in the book of Acts. So we know that it must be important if it's recorded in all those different sections of scripture. Specifically, today we're going to be looking at Matthew's account found in the last chapter, chapter 28 of the Gospel of Matthew, and we're looking at the very last verses in that chapter, uh, verses 16 through 20. It's what, if you have Bible with captions in it, it's what they'll call the Great Commission. And Matthew records the words of Jesus as someone had wisely sensed to me, said that if, if Jesus is speaking, we should be listening. And the interesting thing about these words is the fact that they're actually spoken by Jesus after he'd been nailed to a Roman cross. After he had been nailed to a cross, after he had been beaten, after he'd been flogged, after he had been left there, and after he had died. After he'd been taken off the cross and buried in a tomb. And everything we believe as Christians hinges, as followers of Christ, everything hinges on an event that takes place after Jesus' death, not before his death. And that is Jesus Christ didn't stay dead. The Bible says the penalty of sin is death. And since there is no death, there was no sin in Jesus, then death could not hold him. Jesus rose, right? As we believe, Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And even if you've never been to church before, you probably know that's why we celebrate Easter, what is known in the church as Resurrection Sunday. The event, this event of Jesus being raised from the dead is recorded in Scripture by the eyewitnesses who saw it, but it's also been recorded in secular history by some of the historians of the, the first century. This is a documented piece of history. Whether we choose to believe it or not, we can try and explain it away, but there's never been a convincing argument after studying all the evidence that holds up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ stands up to the strongest arguments against it. But here's what I know. Even with all the, all the evidence of the resurrection of, of Jesus, people still choose to deny it. They choose to ignore the truth. And I think at least for a lot of people, and I, and I know it was for me at one time, we ignore this truth because we know if the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true, if it really took place, and, and I believe it did, the, the secular history and scriptural history says that it did, that if it's true that Jesus is exactly who he said he was, he predicted that he would die, he predicted that he would rise again, he said he was God, and if that's true, then we need to make some changes in our life. And like most of us, we don't like to make changes, do we? We like to do what we like to do. <coughs> Excuse me. And if the resurrection of Jesus is true as recorded in historical documents of scriptures by the eyewitnesses, then that means Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be, not just the Son of God, but God Himself. And if that is true, then we need to obey His command. <clears throat> and if you're like I was, if that's you this morning, one of the things I love about Scriptures is its transparency. It, 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 if that's you this morning, I'm hoping that you're going to find comfort in the words of Jesus and in the writing of those who know Him best. Because when you're looking at this section of Scripture this morning, and even though in, in this, in this Various ways this command, or this commission as it's called, is given in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and also in the book of Acts. We're specifically going to concentrate on Matthew's account, found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now, some believe that this was Jesus' last statements here on earth before he ascended and went back into heaven to sit at the right hand of his Father. Luke records a verse like this. And it says, When then Jesus led them to Bethany, and lifting up his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them, and it was taken up, and he was taken up to heaven. Now, others believe this event was about two weeks after his resurrection, but before his ascension back into heaven. But either way, we know it was the resurrected Christ. We know it's the risen Savior. So the question is, does it really matter when it took place? 
You know, we have to be careful in the church sometimes. I think this is one of the reasons people stay away from church. We have this tendency in churches to argue over details and then miss the bigger picture. We beat people, beat people over the head with the Bible. We beat people over the head with God's law and then tell them to love, even though God's word says the letter of the law kills, which we, well, I gave you an example of that earlier. The letter of the law kills while the spirit of the law gives life. So we're looking at Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, and then we're going to see what it looks like in practice. We're going to look at it in the verses, and then we're going to look at it, what it looks like when we're fulfilling this purpose. Now, before Jesus was falsely accused and executed, Luke, another one of the gospel writers, tells us the account of Jesus telling his 72 of his disciples to go out ahead of him, and that account is found in Luke chapter 10. So we're going to be looking at Matthew 28, verses 16 through 21st, and then we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 10. And the reason I want to start in Matthew chapter 28, verse 16, is a lot of pastors leave out verses 16 and 17 when they talk about the Great Commission. In fact, you don't hear a lot of messages at all on verses 16 and 17. And I think that has a lot to do with it. A lot of pastors really don't know what to do with these verses. As again, you know, one of the reasons I love Scripture so much is God leaves in our humanness. He, he leaves in some of the things that we would want to take out. If you're going to write an inspirational story, then you'd probably leave these first two verses out. If you were going to start the greatest movement in the history of the world, this isn't how you want it to start out. The death of Jesus was a great, a big, a spe spectacular spectacle, if you will. So here it is just a couple days, maybe a couple weeks, maybe about 40 days after Jesus had died on a Roman cross and was buried. And so this is all fresh in everybody's mind. And Matthew records, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Now, I do want to know, and I want you to keep in mind, that a lot of commentators believe there was a lot more than 11 people there that day. That some even believe there were hundreds of people there. This may be what Paul had spoken about when he said Jesus was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. But I want to try to see if you can picture this scene in your mind. Uh, a, a reporter from Fox News or a reporter from CNN is at this event. It's on the last day, right before Jesus leaves the earth. And said, Jesus, uh, you know, we, we hear you're about to leave this world and go back to your heavenly throne. Uh, what's your game plan? How do you plan to reach the entire world with your message? Well, I've I got these 11 men, these 11 disciples who follow me through thick and thin. Uh, excuse me, Jesus. Did you, did you say 11? I, I thought you had 12 in your inner circle. I thought there was 12. Um, well, I did. Uh, I had one. He, he sort of betrayed me. Uh, he turned me over to the Roman authorities, sort of why I was executed, and then he, he went and committed suicide. That man, if I was God, and I speak as a fool, but if I was God, I'd have probably left that part out. But look, it gets worse. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted him. Now, now you lost one of your top men because he's betrayed you. Actually, he betrayed you to a point where you've been executed, and now you've got some that are doubting? If you really are who you say you are? I mean, that's a tough way to start a movement that's going to change the entire world. It's hard to build a great movement on people who doubt you. So if that's you this morning, if you're doubting, if you're a person who's not sure Jesus is who he says he is, and you've been coming to church and you've been worshiping him, but you still have some doubts, that's okay. Jesus took people with doubts and he changed the entire world. If you don't believe or if you have doubts, that's okay, because even the early disciples had some doubts despite the evidence. <laughs> and the evidence was the risen Jesus, the person they saw die standing right in front of them, talking to them, and they still doubted. But notice, they still came, and they still worshipped, and they continued to follow to see if Jesus truly was who he said he was. And we know this after following and after seeing, they believed and they began to believe so much that they were willing to die for this belief. They were willing to die rather than deny that Jesus was exactly who he said he was, the true and living God. 
And 10 of those 11 were executed in some of the most horrific ways for that belief. You don't die for a lie. You die because you believe strongly in that movement, in that cause, in the fact that Jesus was who he said he was. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, don't worry about it. Let's go with, with what we have. Don't worry about anything. Don't even worry about your doubts. Just continue to find, follow, and see. You just go, and in your going, I'll make all your doubts disappear. And Jesus is about to tell his believers, if you'll stop spectating and start participating, if you'll get in the arena where all the action is, I'll make your doubts disappear. Because Jesus knows that we all have doubts at times. So he gives us the remedy for our doubts. But before he gives us the remedy, he has to tell us the reason why we don't need to doubt. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Now, and I have to admit to you, sometimes all this can get confusing. If Jesus is God, he already possessed all authority. Uh, he didn't have to get authority. What does it mean Jesus had been given all authority in heaven and earth? Well, I don't think it means that Jesus didn't have the authority, and now he does have authority. I don't think that's the point. I think Jesus was saying something else. Jesus was saying, this authority has been given to me, therefore, and I heard somebody one time say, and when you see the word therefore in Scripture, uh, you need to see what it's therefore. He says, therefore, this authority has been given to me, and therefore, I'm going to give it to you. You know, if you've ever been in a leadership position, if you've been given a, an authoritative command, you've been commissioned to do something, you know one of the most frustrating things in the world is to be given a mission with no authority. That you've been given a position, but you don't have the power to fulfill that position. And if you have the position and no power, you are no good as a leader. But when you have the authority, when you have the power to distribute and empower others, you can be an effective leader. Without the authority, you may have the position, but you can't get things done. With the authority, you have the power to get things accomplished because now you can empower others. And Jesus said, I have the power, I have the authority to use that power. I have it to give it to those that I desire. The power was given to me. I didn't steal it. I'm legally entitled to it. And I can do with it as I please. And I, it pleases me to give you this authority, not some authority, but all authority, to you to go forth in my power. Jesus said, I know some of you doubt but you don't have to doubt no matter what your circumstances are, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you've been told in the past, no matter where your relationship is with me. You don't have to doubt because all power here on earth and all power in heaven has been given to you if you just put your faith and trust in me. But Jesus knew that some of us would still doubt, and he wanted to keep those who did believe from doubting. So Jesus gives us the remedy for doubt. He's given us a reason why we don't have to doubt. Now he's about to give us the remedy for death. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of age. He says, here's the remedy for death. If you're doubting me, serve me. Don't be a spectator, be a participator. Don't sit around and wait for people to come in. You go out. We're to look outward, not inward. The people with the greatest faith are the ones that despite their doubts, as we're going to see in a few minutes, despite their doubts, there's the one who get to see the miracles and experience the most joy are the ones that go. I believe if I could wrap all of these verses up in just one sentence, if I could wrap it all up in one sentence, Jesus said, I have given you the power, and you're to go out and make disciples that make disciples that make disciples that keep making disciples, and you keep doing that all the way till the end of the age, all the way until I return again as I promised to do. And if Jesus had made disciples and then commanded those disciples to go out and make disciples, the message of the good news of the gospel would have died on the cross the same day Jesus did. Now, I, I, there's a part of this command that talks about baptizing. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the baptizing part of this command. And the reason for that, I believe this command is so important, we're dedicating an entire service to baptism on Sunday, November the 2nd. That's three weeks from the day. It's what's known on our church calendar as All Saints Day. 
It's also the day daylight savings time in, but if you've never been baptized, we'd like you to have an outward ceremony of your inward belief. We'd love you to get baptized here at the first baptismal service at the Odyssey Church, and you'll always be able to remember it because you'll be baptized on All Saints Day. Just fill out the back of uh, the yellow piece of paper in your bulletin, see one of our guest services team after the service, or see me after the service, and we'll make the arrangements or give you more information on getting baptized. Now back to our regularly scheduled program. I want you to think about this. Think about how impossible, how impossible all this is if you passed over the details and just considered the, fact, the facts. In Rodney Stark's book, The Triumph of Christianity, How the Jesus Movement Became the World's Largest Religion, the opening paragraph makes this statement. He was a teacher and a miracle worker. Nearly all of his brief ministry in the tiny, obscure province of Galilee often preaching to outdoor gatherings. A few listeners took up his invitation to follow him, and a dozen or so became his devoted followers. But when he was executed by the Romans, his followers probably numbered no more than several hundred. How is it possible for this obscure Jewish sect to become the largest religion in the world? And if you just look at the facts, Christianity should have really died out centuries ago. The fact is, this command, I mean, it's not a request by Jesus. He doesn't say, this is something you should consider, or, you know, this is something you should probably do. Uh, this isn't a request. It's a command. It's a commission to make disciples of all the world. But exactly how are 11 men make disciples uh, of the entire world when, when some of them doubt? And I've heard some people say, and I've heard it preached, that this is Jesus sort of handing them a tunnel, sort of Jesus saying, okay, guys, I'm out of here. So it's up to you to go. But if that's the meaning of the Great Commission, the Christian movement would have died out in a few years. On the outside, Christianity, this, this worldwide religion, would be, it's impossible. Here's what I believe the real meaning. I believe Jesus is saying to his disciples, both then and now, he's saying, I know that some of you doubt. And I know you're not up to this. But I am. And I have great authority. And in that authority, I'm going to give you a great command. But I'm also going to give you a great promise. I have a great commission for you. I have a great authority for you. And now I'm going to give you a great promise. You don't have to go at all. I'll be with you today, and I'll be with you tomorrow, and I'll be with you the next day. In fact, I'm going to be with you all the way until the end of the age. I will always be with you. Now, Let's look at what this command looks like in practice. Before I give you the account, for those of you who weren't here last week, and as a reminder of those who were, one of the statements that I've talked about was a statement that Jesus made most of us wish probably wasn't in the Bible. It's not one of the most popular things that Jesus ever said. We like to skip this verse. We quoted Matthew's uh, version last week. We're going to quote Luke's version this week. I'm sorry, we quoted Matthew and Luke's version last week. We're going to quote Mark's version this week. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and the sake of the good news, you will save it. In order to be a disciple of Jesus, we have to deny ourselves. We must turn from our selfish ways and follow him. We may not like those words, but it's what Jesus said we must do. We must pick up our cross daily. We must die to self and live for Jesus. To save our life, we must lose it. And on the outside, that sort of looks like an oxymoron, did not it? We must die to live. And Jesus isn't saying we can't have things. There, there's a lot of people in the Bible who had a whole lot of things. But we do have to put his things before our things, and sometimes that feels like losing. You know, one of the things I think keep most people from following Jesus. What kept me from following Jesus so long is I liked the sin I was in. I didn't want to give it up. And I thought somehow in my mind, the life that Jesus called me to wasn't as good as the life I was living. What I had to give up was somehow be better than the life I was being called to. And I know how wrong I was today. But it took me a while. I, I don't like to lose. And one day, I just had to realize that it came to me. Any, for any of us to have anything significant at all, we must lose something else. One day I was already realized I was already choosing 
one thing over another. I was choosing the life I wanted to live. I was choosing my plans and my selfish desires over the life that God had for me and the plans and the desires he had for me. I mean, I even knew the words. I was in church. I knew the words of Jeremiah 29, 11, where I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, that to give you a future and a hope. I knew the words, but somehow I thought my plan, which ultimately did lead me to disaster, were better than the plans that God had for me, which he had promised me would not lead to disaster. I had to learn the hard way. I'm praying that you don't have to learn the way I had to learn. The hard way. Sometimes you have to lose to win. And sometimes to win, you have to lose. The account of what we call the Great Commission. This is what it looks like in practice. Luke chapter 10. And keep in mind, Luke was a doctor. He was very methodical in his research. Luke tells us he went about to make an orderly account just as the eyewitnesses had handed them down to him. Chapter 10 of his gospel, his account of his life, of Jesus, Luke tells us about sending out 72 people ahead of him. Some translations say 70. Either way, it was a lot of people, and Jesus sent them out in pairs to every town and every place he was about to go. And again, in my analytical mind, you know, not all of this made sense to me. Maybe it doesn't make sense to you. I'm thinking to myself, if Jesus is God, why did Jesus have to send people ahead of him? You know, you don't need to do that. God is God. But this is what I've learned about Jesus. This has been so impactful in my life. Is Jesus doesn't need anything from us. Jesus wants something for us. He doesn't want anything from us, but he wants something for us. This wasn't for his benefit. This was the benefit for those who had been following, for those who were willing to step out of the crowd. This is late in Jesus' ministry. He's already had large crowds following. He's been pouring himself into others, and now he's asked those who are following to begin to pour themselves out into others. He wants them to pour back into others what's been poured into them. And these 72 people step out of the crowd and say, you poured into me, now I will pour into others. And even if you didn't grow up in church, even if you haven't been to church a whole lot, you probably recognize these next verses. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send out workers into the field. Now notice the things that Jesus didn't say. He didn't say there's not enough money. He didn't say there wasn't enough money. He didn't say there wasn't enough Time, he didn't say there wasn't enough of anything other than workers. He said there's not enough work. Jesus tells us he wants us to do a lot of things. He wants us to produce a big crop of dice. That there's never going to be a short demand of what he wants to do in this world. There'll be no shortage of things people need from Jesus, but there will be a shortage of workers. So here and also in the Great Commission, Jesus says, I want you to come along. I want you to be part of what I'm doing. I want you to come along and experience what I have for you. And then Jesus gives one of the strangest, one of the strangest motivational speeches I've ever heard. If we're starting a worldwide movement, if you're going to start a movement that's going to change the entire world that ultimately would become the, the biggest movement in the history of the world, this wouldn't be the speech I expect to hear to get people to go along with me. Jesus says, now remember that I am sending you out as lambs among the wolves. Don't take any money with you. Don't take a traveling bag with you. Don't take an extra pair of sandals. And don't stop to greet anybody on the road. Okay, all you volunteers, all you 72 who stepped out of the crowd, I'm not going to let you bring anything with you. Defend yourself. I'm not going to let you get to grab people along the way to help you out. Can you imagine if I sat here in the church and I'm asking for volunteers and you all arise and say, okay, I'm going to send you out as lambs into the wolves. What do wolves do to lambs? They eat them up. If I was one of those 72, I think I'd unvolunteer myself. I, um, Jesus, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I forgot something. I'm going to go sit back down, okay? I think the point Jesus is saying here is he's telling this group of people the same thing he's telling us later in the Great Commission that's found in music is, I want you to go out. I want you to step out. I want you to go ahead of me. I don't want you just to follow anymore. I want you to not just spectate anymore. I want you to begin to participate. And, and you don't need anything special to go. If you want to volunteer, I'm going to be with you. 
You don't have to have special talents. You don't have to have special gifts. You don't have to have special tools. All you need is a desire to tell others because I'm sending you with my authority and I'm going along with you in spirit. And sometimes I think we come to God and we make it too hard. We're trying to bring other people in and we think we have to know a lot of scripture. We think we have to have the Bible memorized. We think we have to have to, to, to know all the answers. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Just tell people what I've done for you. Make it simple. If you don't want to do that, make it simple. Just invite them to come to church with you. Serve them. Love them. Let Jesus sign through you. When you go out with your friends, when you go out to dinner, when you go out to work, when you go out to the grocery store, every time you go out, tell people by showing people. Love them and serve them. Going out doesn't mean you have to go around the world. You can serve him right here. Sometimes he will call you to go to missions. But most of the time he tells you to serve right where you're at. And as important as all that is, Jesus doesn't tell us to make converts. Make converts is easy. You know, sometimes you can just play some soft music and give a strong altar call. And people will come up and they'll say a little prayer. That's not what Jesus is saying. He said, make disciples. And making disciples is hard because it takes time and it takes energy and it takes effort. If I, if I was to put all this into context, I'd say the Odyssey Church. It, it might sound like Jesus was talking to Odyssey. It might sound something like this. He says, I'm coming to Selmaville. I'm coming to Willisville. I'm coming to Roxana. I'm coming to Millsboro. I'm coming to Frankfurt. I'm coming to Bangor. And I want you to go out and prepare a way for me. See, Jesus involved people. Jesus valued involving people. Jesus launches the biggest winningness movement the world has ever seen. The biggest winningness movement in the history of the world, before or since, and it starts with and continues to gain momentum even today with ordinary people like me and you. People who have doubts. People who drifted away. People who, who even denied Jesus. People who didn't have any special tools. People who didn't have a lot of education. And he can accomplish the same thing through his people like me and you because he's given us his authority and he's promised us to go with us. And after you've been following Jesus, and Jesus asks you to step out of the crowd and go and pour yourself out, what's been poured into you? And like I said, this isn't for his, our benefit. I mean, this isn't for his benefit. He can do this without us. It's for our benefit. Jesus doesn't need anything from us. Jesus wants something for us. Look what happens. When the 72 disciples return, they joyfully, they joyfully reported to him. When they stepped out of the crowd and began to pour into others what had been poured into them, they were filled with joy. They had joy all because they made a decision to go out instead of staying in. Those that stayed in didn't get the same kind of joy, did they? And Jesus tells each one of us, now that you've been following for a while, I want you to go out and pour into others what's been poured into you. I want you to go out and plant some seeds. I'm going to do some amazing things in this area, and I want you to take what have been other, what I have and others have poured into you, and I want you to invest it and pour it out into others, and it's all for your benefit, not my benefit. They'll get something out of it, but you'll get more out of it. The crowds, the one that stayed, they didn't experience the joy. Only those who decided to go out got to experience the miracles and the power and the authority of Jesus. He invited people then to go out. He invites people today to do the same thing. And let me ask you a question. Do you think those disciples who stepped out of the crowds and experienced the miracles and experienced the authority and experienced the power of Jesus and had all that joy, do you think they could ever go back? To just spectating again? You think they would just go back and be part of the crowd again? I don't think so. After they had participated and experienced in the presence of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the joy of Jesus, they had found in making disciples, I don't think they'd ever be satisfied with just being part of the crowd again. I know I never will be. The Odyssey Church needs people to step out of the crowd and go ahead of Jesus. We need people who are willing to pour out what's been poured into them. We need people to plant seeds and make investments in others. We need people to step out of the crowd and be part of our music ministry. Whether you sing or play an instrument or any instrument, we'd like you to join us on Sunday mornings and feel the joy of helping others experience the joy of worship. We need volunteers to help in our upcoming elementary age ministry, our teen and young adults ministry, our nursery, our simulation team. One area people don't even think about as serving, as ministering, as helping build disciples is we want people to look like we know we're expecting them. 
We, we need people to come out and step out of the crowd and take an hour or two on Friday to clean the church building so that when people walk in here, it looks like we're expecting them yes. And oh, we don't need 72 people to step out. But we do need to find 15 to 18 people who are willing to step up and step out. We need people who are willing to make a decision to stop being a spectator and start being a participator. People who will pour out what's been poured into them and help us follow the command of Jesus to be disciples who make disciples who make disciples so the message will continue until the end of the age. And if Jesus hadn't done this, his message would have been gone a long, long time ago. And remember, the person who gets the most benefit is you. We want to give you an opportunity to get involved in what God is up to. To take what's in your cup and pour it into the cup of someone else. And we're not going to throw you in the woods. We're not going to do what Jesus said and say, okay, lambs, go among the woods. We're going to train you. We're going to help you. We're going to bring you part of it. We're going to give you the tools to make you successful. We're going to be, give you the tools so that you can stop being a spectator and start being a participator. Jesus takes ordinary people, people like me and you, with all our doubts, with all our baggage, and he changed the world. And we believe he's still calling us to change the world, change our world, our family's world, our community's world, to experience his power and his love and his authority and his joy by making more disciples. So if we're willing to step out, if you're willing to put your name and phone number in, an email address, one of those yellow pieces of paper, and drop them in a the basket by the door when you leave. And if you want to be baptized, we'd like you to get more information on being baptized uh, two weeks from the day, November the 2nd. You'll circle the word baptism on the back and leave it in the basket as you do. Either I or somebody from the church will contact you sometime this week. Think about the joy that you would feel. If you knew you had a positive influence on a child's life, if you knew at the end of the day you poured into others what had been poured into you and they were able to live life and live it more abundantly because you had the courage to stand up and step out of the crowd because you knew Jesus was with you and he'd given you his authority to make disciples. And the question is, the question is, will you be willing to step up and step out? Will you be willing to go from a spectator to a participator? Will you be a disciple that makes disciples that makes disciples? Will you be willing to be one of the few who makes a difference in the many? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you today for your power and your authority that you have given us, for the promise of your presence as we go out, and we pray, Lord, today that you'll use the people at the Odyssey Church that you'll use the Odyssey Church to be a church that helps people find and follow Jesus. A church that makes disciples, that makes disciples, that makes disciples. In the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.